fun and presents. Certainly God has given them to us this day, a beautiful day in which to be able to come and to worship Him, to give praise and adoration to our God. Hope that you'll be back this evening as we again enter into worship our God at 6 o'clock. And then, of course, we have Bible classes at 7 o'clock, so we invite you to be here at all of those times. This morning, I want us to look at a study uh, looking at and considering the growth of the church in the first century. Because without any fear of being contradicted, the church did grow very fast in the first century. As we begin the New Testament period of time, uh, Acts the second chapter, we see Peter preaching a great gospel sermon. In that sermon, he convicted the Jews that they had crucified God's Son, that God had proclaimed him to be Lord and Savior. He was approved by God by the miracles that Jesus did, verse 22. He continues to establish that even though he was crucified by the wicked hands of those Jews to whom Peter was speaking at the time, that God did not leave him in the grave. That was the fulfillment of prophecy uh, and that God raised him from the dead not allowing his body to see corruption, nor his spirit to remain within that Hadean realm, but that in that resurrection he being raised from the grave never to die again. And so he concludes this sermon in verse 36 by saying, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Those who heard this were not told of all of their reactions, every individual that was their reaction, but many of them were pricked in their hearts. Verse 37, and uh, asked Peter and the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter reveals to them their need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and your children and all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then we come down to verse 41, where we're told that they that gladly received his word were baptized. In other words, they were doing what Peter had just told them to do in order to be saved. And then it adds that there were, the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. We find in thus that 3,000 people on this one occasion, this day of Pentecost, obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they were added unto the church. As we continue reading in that second chapter, though, we come down to verse 47. And it tells us that here's these Christians who are praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, the King James says, uh, such as should be saved. Actually, the terminology there is that those who are being saved were being added to the church. So here as individuals on a daily basis that were obeying that which Peter had told us back in verse 38 that was necessary for the salvation of their souls, here is people on a daily basis who were obeying that truth and the Lord was then taking them and adding them to the church. What a marvelous growth that we see taking place at this period of time. If we go over a couple of chapters to chapter 4, we again see the emphasis of the, the growth of the church during this early uh, 
part of the, the Lord's church. When we come down to verse 4 of chapter 4 of Acts, we're told that how many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of men was about 5,000. So now then, many were believing. Many were obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the, work, the aspect of believing there is that aspect of not just an acknowledging that God is or an acknowledging that Christ is our Savior. It's not saying some sinner's prayer that man has made up today. But instead, it is that obedience to the gospel even as you would see with the Philippian jailer in Acts 16th chapter when they told him to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then they continued to teach him the word of God. He then was baptized and then in verse 34 of Acts 16 he's called a believer. These individuals were being baptized into Jesus Christ. Many of them though it says, an amazing growth of the Lord's church. And then it adds that the number of men, this is besides women, the number of men were 5,000. So there is an amazing growth in this early part of the Lord's church. But growth, when we start seeing and talking about growth, growth is a conditional thing. When we uh, look at a baby that's born into this world. For that baby to grow, it's conditional. There has to be certain things that are there in order for the baby to grow. What if you don't feed that baby? What's going to happen? Is it going to grow? No, it's going to die. There's conditions that are necessary for growth to take place. As in our mental development, if we're going to learn about something, if we're going to grow in a certain aspect of our knowledge, there has to be conditions that are met. We have to study. We have to be taught certain things in order for us to learn and grow within that area. It doesn't matter what area you're dealing with either. Growth is always conditional. Well, the early church grew. They grew very fast in that period of time. But for there to be growth, there has to be conditions that have to be met. And when we start complying with those conditions, then we can grow. If we don't comply with those conditions, we're going to die. So let's look at a few principles and I'm not going to try to say that that which we're going to look at is going to involve every condition that is necessary. But we do want to look at some conditions that are necessary, that are needed for growth to take place. And why the church grew so fast in the first century. I think one of the first things we see within the Lord's church and growth taking place is that they made a united effort. Go back to chapter 2. We read in verses 36 through verse 41 the conditions for obedience to the gospel and for those individuals to be saved and as those that gladly received the word we see were about 5,000 were added to the Lord's church in verse 41. Why? Because they met the conditions that were necessary for salvation. And thus, meeting those conditions, they then were added by the Lord to the church. But if we skip down a few verses to verse 44, we start seeing a unity that is there within the Lord's church. When it says that all that believed were together and had all things common. There is a united effort that is being seen within the Lord's church. These brethren were united. First off, they did not have the strife of denominationalism. As someone within the world today who wants to determine to, well, I want to find religion, however they might want to express it, and whether it's scripture or not, as far as their expression, 
we're not dealing with that right now. We're just, here's that individual who wants to find something. They want to become religious. Now, they might not know anything about the Lord or the church or anything else. They might not know much about the Bible. They might recognize, well, the Bible's from God. How are they going to determine what to do? They get the yellow pages. Well, let me find a church. And they start looking at all of the listings in the yellow pages. Be overwhelming, wouldn't it? Well, they just start driving down the street. Oh, well, you know, right down here we have one, then another, then right over here another, and you just keep going down the road and you have one after another. Rather confusing. Now, then I realize the denominational world says, well, it doesn't really matter. We're all going the same place. We all believe differently, though. We're going to teach different things. We're going to practice different things. And yet we all make up this body of Christ. To them, as they put it, an invisible body of Christ. Well, how do I know which one to go through? It's rather confusing as far as someone who doesn't really know what God's Word teaches. How am I going to determine these things? Now then the answer, of course, to that is very clearly what's revealed in the Bible. The denominational world says, well, just find one that you're comfortable with. No, that's not the right concept. The concept is God tells us what to do and we do it. It's not whether I'm comfortable with it or not. It's not whether I like it or not. I do what God says and I conform my life to what he says. And that's the concept that the Bible presents. You obey what he said. You worship according to the principles that are found within the Bible. You organize the church according to the organization that's found in the Bible. And on and on we could go with different aspects. That's what we are to do. Now we should understand that within the Lord's church we should at least. But what about this person in the world who doesn't have that understanding? They've not been taught in those areas. They look at all of these things. Each one worships a little bit differently. Each one teaches a little bit different aspect. I don't know what's right. And then to them, they've been told so many times, well, you can't really understand the Bible anyway. It's such a complicated book. And if I start trying to read it, you know, a lot of people, well, I'm going to start reading the Bible. And so they just, well, okay, I'll read here. And then next time, they open it up, oh, I'll start reading here. And they have no concept in order to understand the Bible and what it's teaching to begin with. The early church did not face a lot of those things. There was no, uh, no strife of denominationalism. There were religious groups. You had Judaism. You had paganism. You had Christianity. But within that realm of Christianity, you didn't have all of these divisions that you see within Christendom today. And yes, I realize when I say that that denominationalism is not a part of Christianity. That's why the little quotes there. They didn't face that. There was a united effort on the part of the church. John, the 17th chapter in that prayer for you, a prayer that Jesus made, after praying for himself and his apostles, he prayed for all of those who would believe. And it states in John 17, verse 20 and 21, Neither pray I for these alone, that's talking about the apostles alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Let me add that emphasis there, through their word. There's the basis of unity that he's going to pray for. 
denominationalism says we're going to have unity based upon not upon God's word, but upon we're going to have it no matter what we believe. Ignoring what God's word says. But it says through their word that they all may be divided. And you go your way and I go my way and we'll all go to heaven together. No, that's not what it says either, obviously. It is that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they all may be one in us. Now notice why he says this unity is to be found. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. There is to be a unity within the Lord's church why? For those who are outside of Christ, the world. When there is division that takes place, then what happens? There is, from a worldly standpoint, what am I to believe? What am I to do? How am I to act? How am I to worship? There is confusion that reigns. Denominationalism comes along and says, and, and prays for division and says that that division is good so that we and each do whatever we want to do. Well, if we can each do what we want to do, let's just forget about coming here at all. I need to worship at home, uh, take a couple of minutes to worship by uh, any way that I want to. It's going to be fine anyway. We're all going to go to heaven. So I need to just take a couple of seconds out on Sunday to think about God and go on. If not, why not? But Christ prayed for unity. Why? So that the world might believe. Within the early church, you see a standing together. Even within the Lord's church today, we spend a great deal of time fighting one another. I recognize the need to stand for truth. And I also recognize the fact that just about every book within the New Testament is written because of problems within the church. And to address those problems, but there's also the principle that Paul sets forth even in addressing those problems within the church of Galatians 5 and verse 15. But if ye bide and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Paul recognized the need to stand firm for the truth of God's word. And here were these Judaizing teachers which were coming in among them trying to destroy the flock. There was a need to stand and to fight against those Judaizing teachers, yes. Just as there is a need today to fight against all false doctrine. But the problem is sometimes that we become so consumed with that aspect that we lose sight of that saving of souls and evangelism. The saving of souls from those in the world. We need to be working for peace. Romans 14 and verse 19, we're told, let us therefore follow after these things which make for peace, whereby we may edify another, or one may edify another. And in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, before going into those seven great ones of unity. Verse 3 says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now when someone challenges that unity of the Spirit, by teaching false doctrine, they have to be we have to stand against them. But what true peacemaking is, is yes, standing against them in order to bring them back to the cause of Christ. To restore them to faithfulness to God. Why? So that we can stand together. 
so that we can be unified, so that we can have peace one with another. In the book of Romans, where he says that we are to follow after those things that make for peace, Paul was fighting the Judaizing teachers. You have problems that are there. And he was addressing those problems. He was dealing with those problems and trying to get those Judaizing teachers to come to the truth. But they made a stand together in that. And as they all stood together, yes, against the false teachers, they made a stand together, though. There was unity that was there. Jesus prayed, or set forth in the Beatitudes, those things that will make us successful, blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the children of God. Does God want peace? Absolutely. Does it stand against those who are not his children? Absolutely. His face is against them. But there's peace with those who are his children. The Lord's face is toward those who are righteous. His ears are open unto their prayer. 1 Peter 3 and verse 12. So it should be with us. And as we have that spirit of unity, of cooperation, we're going to be more effective in teaching others. You find a congregation, let's just deal with it on a congregational basis, who's always fighting one with another. There's always strife within that congregation. You let someone else come in and you see that fighting among them. Let me ask you, how many of you want to attend that type of a place? Where they don't even get along and can't even get along one with another. And this group won't talk to this group or this person won't talk to that person. You want to be in that place? No. There was cooperation in the Lord's church. In Ecclesiastes 4th chapter, verses 9 through verse 12, Solomon writes that two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall, be, shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. He is showing for us in these illustrations the power of unity. Of our being one. Threefold cord. In other words, you get one cord by itself, you can easily cut it or break it, but you get three together and it becomes strong. That's the way that Christianity is to be. There is to be that spirit of cooperation among us where we have a love and a concern one for another. Cooperation, a united effort. In 1 Corinthians 12th chapter, in verse 25, Actually, the entire 12th chapter, and if you read the entire book of 1 Corinthians, you deal with this, this very subject. Because they had the sin of division there in Corinth. In the first four chapters, Paul deals specifically with that sin. But as you come to chapter 12, he's dealing specifically now in chapter 12 with miraculous gifts. And within the church at Corinth, some had one miraculous gift, while someone else had another talent. That was given our gift that was given by God. And one person who had one gift would think himself preeminent over someone else who had another gift from God. I'm better than you because I have this gift. And generally it was the gift to speak in tongues was what they thought was a better gift. 
And so if I can speak in tongues, I'm better than you are. And it caused divisions. And Paul, within this context now, is showing how that every member of the church is comprising the body of Christ. And how that the body of Christ is to work together, even as a physical body works together. And in verse 25, he makes the point that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. The word schism means division. Don't have division within the body of Christ. You should have a care and concern one for another. What was happening in relationship to these brethren at Corinth, they were divided. One thinking more highly than about himself than he would of others. And so he had no care, no concern for that other individual. And Paul is showing that's not the way that the body of Christ works. There's to be unity within the body of Christ. A love, a care, a concern, one for another. How we need that within the Lord's church today. And how we need that to be based upon the Word of God. True unity will never come separate and apart from the Word of God. You take the Word of God out of we're not going to have unity. Oh, we might be united as the denominational world thinks they're united, but in reality they're not. They still have problems one with another. They have divisions. Only when we go to God's Word and we're united upon God's Word can we be united. And that will bring, bring true unity. And unity brings strength. And when we have that same love and care and concern one for another, you're going to start seeing a growth that takes place. When you see back in, the, in Acts the second chapter, those individuals... If you continue on within the book of Acts, they had all things common. What was it? They would give of their means to support others that were there. Some went and sold their houses and their lands, would bring their money to the apostles so that distribution could be made among all of them. That didn't mean that, number one, they were forced to. While it would remain theirs, it was theirs. They could do with it what they wanted to. But they had an attitude. That's what we're dealing with, an attitude of unity and love one for another. That here is a brother in need. I'm going to help him. I'm going to do what is necessary to try to help him out. That's the way we need to be within the Lord's church. And when others then start seeing us, and seeing the help and the aid that we give one another, the love that is there, and demonstrating that love in our actions, then yes, it becomes an aid in furthering the cause of Christ. A second reason that we find is that they were steadfast. Again, look in Acts, the second chapter. We read how that they obeyed that gospel. They that gladly received the word were baptized and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls in verse 41. The very next verse shows their steadfastness. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Notice the very first thing that's mentioned again. God's word. The Apostles' Doctrine. There's to be a steadfastness upon God's Word. That's where we're to be steadfast. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, after Paul goes through a discussion dealing with the aspect of the resurrection and how that Christ was raised from the dead and He becomes the first fruits of all of them that are raised. We're told that through that, we, through Christ, we have a victory. And then in verse 58, he sums it up by saying, Therefore, let all, uh, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Steadfast, unmovable, based upon what? Upon the foundation of God's Word. And we're not going to be moved away from that. 
Notice again the very next chapter in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 16 and verse 13. He gives them four great admonitions. Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men. Be strong. Next verse tells us to love. Another admonition. Watch and then stand fast in the faith. There's the basis for that steadfastness is God's word again. And we're going to stand upon God's word no matter what might come. No matter what error might try to creep in, we're going to stand fast upon God's word. When we vacillate back and forth, unstable, we weaken the church. Notice what James writes, starting in James 1, verse 6. And we are to ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Unstable, a double-minded man. The word that's translated double-minded here literally means two-souled. He has two souls. Now, not literally does he have two souls. Of course, he has only one, but it's talking about his double-mindedness. He thinks this way, he thinks that way. He can't make a decision. He wants to go both ways. Remember what Jesus said back in Matthew, the, ninth, uh, the sixth chapter, that no man can serve two masters? That's a double-minded man. He's trying to serve both God and mammon. And God, Christ says you can't do that. You're either going to love the one and hate the other, or else you're going to hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. He had earlier stated that where your treasure is, there's where your heart is going to be. But here's a double-minded man, a two-souled man. He wants to do both. He wants to ride the fence of the world in Christ. Now then, James says that type of man's unstable. He's wavering back and forth. And that man is not going to receive anything of the Lord. He becomes a hindrance to the cause of Christ. When you see the first century church, they had a single-mindedness of obedience to God's Word. It didn't matter what would come upon them, they were going to remain faithful to God and His will. And so when persecution arises, for example, in Acts 7th chapter, actually you start, start seeing it in the 6th chapter, where this group of individuals catch Stephen and they take him to the Sanhedrin and make false accusations against him. And here Stephen now comes along and he makes his defense in chapter 7. And as he sums up that defense, he deals very strongly with the Sanhedrin. He's stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears. You did always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of, the fathers, uh, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And now then, you've done the same thing as your fathers in killing the Christ. A united effort upon God's word is what we're going to see with Stephen. And what happens? People were so, these, the Sanhedrin was so upset and mad that they ran on him and bit him. Gnashed on him with their teeth. And that wasn't good enough for them. They take him out of the city and they stone him to death. And there the people were laying, those who were stoning him laid their clothes at Saul's feet. And it says as we enter chapter 8 how that Saul made havoc of the church to such an extent that the church that was there at Jerusalem we read earlier in chapter 4, how that there were at least 5,000 men. 
Now then, there's, they are scattered abroad. What did they do? They had a united effort. They remained steadfast in God's word because as they went, they went preaching the gospel, verse 8, or verse 4, chapter 8. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And the emphasis is, as they went, they were preaching the word. A united, stable, steadfast effort of preaching God's word. And remaining steadfast upon that word. And what happened? We see the growth of the church. There's a story of an Indian who wrote a little bit of poetry and he takes that poetry to a missionary that was there. There were several verses to this poem, but all of the verses said the same thing. Now, so I'll just read the first two lines of this poem, because every one of them repeats this. It was, go on, 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 go on. We would say, well, that's not too good of poetry, and that's probably true. It's not, but it does express a great principle. We have to be steadfast in going on with God's Word, remaining steadfast upon that Word and teaching that Word to others, and not allowing anyone or anything to come between ourselves and our obedience to God. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we would plead with you this morning not to obey what man says. Doesn't matter what I might say. Doesn't matter what I might claim that you might need to do. Take God's word and do exactly what God's word says. Stand upon the truth of God's word. What did Peter tell them on the day of Pentecost? Upon their their fact that they believed because they now recognized they had crucified the Son of God. He tells them, you need to repent. You need to be baptized. Every one of you needs to be baptized. The purpose of that baptism is for the remission of your sins. He says you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You'll be saved. You'll have the remission of your sins. Your, those past sins will be taken away from you. The Lord will then add you to the church, we see in verse 47, where you can continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What is it? You can add the truths of God's word to your life. You can have the attitudes that the Bible teaches you to have. You can change your thoughts, yes, to conform to the thoughts of God. You can conform your actions to the actions that God has revealed for us to take. Our speech will be the speech of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. What is it? We will continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, united together with all of those others who will stand fast on God's word. If you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, become a Christian. But you're not living in the way that the Bible reveals for us to live. And why not come back into him? Repent of your sins. Let us pray with you as an unfaithful child of God who is repenting and becoming faithful once again. And loving Heavenly Father will receive you back. And we'll forgive those sins. And once again, you will be able to enjoy the blessings that come from Christ. If you need to come this morning, then we plead with you to do so as we stand and sing this invitation.